So now you're living in Nashville, but you recorded the album in Los Angeles, right? I did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the uh, the musicians, uh, uh, both the drummer and his wife, who played the bass. Uh, they're based in LA, and uh, so it, it made sense this time for me to go out there to well, it does join them. The drummer you're talking about is Jay Bellarose, who just about everything he plays on, I fall in love with. So I can, don't blame you. For oh, that. right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yes. I mean, sometimes, it's, you know, one of the songs on this record, the, uh, the drums come in well before the rest of us. And uh, I'm just fine with that. I could listen to drums all by themselves. <laughs> I think I had the same <laughs> thought about that. When it, <laughs> yeah. When it's Jay Bellrose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, I'm in Auckland, and uh, before we get to talking about the record, um, I, I, I moved here from the States in 1994. One of the first big concerts I saw here in Auckland was R.E.M., Crowded House, and Grantley Buffalo. I was wondering if you were, had any memories wow. of that. I do. You were at that show? I sure was, man. Oh, that's crazy. That's, uh, wow. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I remember it. I remember it quite well. Um, we did our own show the night before as well um, at, a, at a local place in uh, Auckland. Um, but yeah, that was an incredible, incredible evening there. <laughs> yep, yep, yeah. yep. Something to remember. I, I just ran across a, a review or something uh, earlier today of the show and made me think about it. So it was a good way to start my yeah. stay here in New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I would think so. Yeah. What a, I mean, what a beautiful place. Good eggs, as I recall. Good coffee, good fresh eggs. There you go. <laughs> These are the things that I, I value. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first so thing what's the vibe like in Nashville Ooh. today? Uh, you know, the eggs are all right here. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, they're a little, probably apt to be fried, you know, whereas you're more right. in poaching right. country. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, the yeah. vibe here in Nashville is, uh, you know, it's it's a tough situation here. Um, this town thrives on uh, music and nightlife, and um, so that's been a hard adjustment. Um, yeah. You know, uh, when you consider, you know, that so many musicians make their livelihood uh, from performing every night, and uh, the bars, you know, that's the cold that they have to shovel on every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's just a really tough situation. So it uh, it hasn't been easy this this year. Well, it's got to be tough. Yep. Well, at least you got some new music to listen to. Uh, so your album came yes. out a couple of weeks ago. Lightning, show us your stuff. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And like I said, I, I from the moment I heard that Jay was on the record playing drums, I, I fell in love with it. And Eric Haywood on pedal steel is very good as yeah. well. So, so what? what uh, it's not too far since the previous record so what was your thought process getting this one together well uh i had been conspiring with jay for uh a few years actually i mean even even uh, going back to 2014 or something like that we we were talking about trying to get in to record and uh, for one reason or another, just it just took us a while to pull it off. We had worked together out in LA many years ago, like about a decade ago, right. um, both in the studio and on the road. And uh, you know, I consider him a good friend. And um, but it felt like this was the time that it was going to work out. You know, uh, the record before this was um, uh, a little more feverish uh, in its uh, genesis. You know. Um, you know the kind of record that uh, that I write when I'm when I when I feel like I urgently need to address social matters, and uh, that was called Wittershins. Right. Um, this album is a little bit of a pivot. This is probably a, more of a a personal uh, soul searching kind of record. Yes, it seems very reflective. I guess is the word I would use. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's a very good way to put it. And um, I think in some ways, uh, musicians like Jay. And his wife Jennifer, they uh, they tend to pull that out of me as well. You know, uh -huh. I think uh, the notion that I I could possibly work with them it helped focus some of my energies in terms of what I was writing and how I was hearing this record. And uh, and it was quite simply, uh, you know, just a, a bonus to be able to bring in Eric Haywood. Yeah. You know, um, he's fantastic. I mean, he plays everything you could imagine, but uh, 
uh, for the most part, stuck to pedal steel on this album here, with the exception of Gather Up, he plays some acoustic guitar. Ah, uh, yeah. And, uh, I wanted to talk about Gather Up. Because <laughs> yeah, Gather let's Up talk is a really cool track, and it kind of stands out from the other ones. So uh, it's kind of got this yeah. gospel blues funky kind of thing going on. Uh, where did yes. that come from? You know, uh, where did that come from? I think that was probably a song where, in terms of the music, uh, I was I was thinking of writing a song that would just be built for uh, for Jay and I to play together. You know, uh -huh. um, um, you know, something that was a little bit off the beaten track. And um, in terms of the uh, the musical inspiration, the lyrical inspiration, I was pulling from all kinds of childhood memories of being. Uh, hauled off to little country churches with my grandparents where uh, old men would work up a sweat <laughs> and uh, you know, they would, they would, they would be sermonizing and uh, sometimes they'd be playing the guitar and, 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 and screaming. And uh, so I, I thought, wow, I, I think I can tap into that pretty easily. Yep, yep. Um, so it's one way of sort of, <laughs> of sort of uh, 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 sermonizing and summarizing some of the chaos that we live with, um, you know, every day, it seems. Yeah. I grew up in Western Pennsylvania in a very rural community. And uh, I remember in church that a lot of, they played a lot of saws. There was saw play going on. You're serious? Really? Wow. <laughs> it sounds like you went to, you, you went to the church of Vaudeville. <laughs> <laughs> it was That's interesting at least, you know, kind of got a, from the usual piano and organ stuff. <laughs> right. Goodness. And that, uh, that's a, an instrument that does double duty as well. You know, you can build a house with, right. with one, of, one of those. <laughs> or run rampant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So did, were you writing the songs as the sessions were happening or were they all set to go? Oh, they were set to go. I, I uh, you know, my, my recording sessions happen so quickly that I'm, I'm always one to be very prepared. And I, and I try to live with the songs. I probably wrote 30 of them before I whittled it down to 12. And once we were in the studio looking at the clock, I said, let's, let's focus on these five, on or these 10 rather, five per side. I, I kind of used the, uh, the old LP model, um, knowing that, you know, I would, I would press an LP and it would be nice if it wasn't too long. Right, you know? right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but I, I went in very prepared in that, in that way, you know. I mean, it's always a balance of like feeling comfortable with the songs. Uh, I don't make uh, extravagant demos these days. I try to save a lot of that for the studio so that I'm surprised when I go in. Right. But I like to be prepared. I like to know what key I'm going to sing it in and, you know. Yeah, um, that, that helps. <laughs> I try to test the, uh, the membrane of the song well before I go into the studio. And sometimes that means uh, playing it on the piano or, or, and then transposing it to the guitar or vice versa. So I stretch at it and I, and I tinker with it in my home laboratory before I, okay. I bring it into everyone else. You know? yeah. And then what kind of yeah. communication do you have with the rest of the, the players? Do you talk to them about what the song means to you? Do you just kind of let them find it on their own? What, what happens there? I feel like uh, I feel like uh, it's it's best uh, to let them find it on their own. Um, you know, uh, most of the songs, I would say, all of the songs are really so much about the feel of it. You know, and yeah. a lot of that comes down to uh, a musician's ability to interpret uh, what I'm doing with the guitar and with my voice, and um, trying to find a pocket. You know. A way to kind of get in there and, and not um, step on it, but to elevate it. And um, all of these folks that we're, we're talking about are so sensitive in that way. You know, it doesn't it doesn't take much coaxing. And um, um, I mean, case in point, you know, when it came together, up, I I knew that I had a a, a certain number of um, uh, percussive jabs that I wanted to to work in. You know, that each time I would I would come to the section gather up you know um it would increase you know there would be three the first time and four the second time and then and then five and then the final the final round would would go about 15 times you know so i i <laughs> i'm not one for math rock but i i knew that i i wanted to kind of prolong that that sort of violent stabbing it's like you know it's like the 
the theme to uh, Psycho, I guess. Uh, right. And so I said that to Jay. I said, so you got three and then four and then five. And then we're going to do 13 of those jabs at the end. And he said, yeah, can we just, um, uh, can we just play it? And I, well, yeah, sure. We can just play it. <laughs> There's no harm in that. And, um, and his instincts were right. We just played it and it was all right. fine. He knew when to stop when I stopped and, uh, you know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's always so, helped. Well, speaking of Psycho yeah. and Hitchcock, I mean, <laughs> despite the fact that the album is kind of reflective and quieter, I mean, it starts out with a line like vultures on the hitching post. So I mean, think about birds, yeah. right? The birds right there. So it, there's a That's dark right. undercurrent there's, to it. You know, there is. And I, I, uh, I appreciate you uh, <laughs> making note of that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I'm one to, uh, to shy away from those things. I'm, these are the things that sort of occupy my thoughts in the late hours, you know? Right. It's, it's, it's why I can't fall asleep so easily. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that song, uh, Ain't Done Yet, um, is about sort of staring down uh, uh, the, the prospects of, of failure or mortality or, uh, you know, any number of things that seem to dog us. Right. Um, but it's buoyant. A buoyant, yeah, joyful. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like I like that sort of strange juxtaposition. I guess, um, right. you know, there there's dark and light, you know, and, but sometimes it's not so uh, so obvious in these songs. Um, I like a good dark lyric set to a, uh, you know, a tune that you can whistle. <laughs> cool, <laughs> and and there's horns on that track, and on a few others, you have a gentleman by the name of Donnie T. Levin playing. Kind of euphonium and trombonium. Yeah. So tell me about that. Yeah, uh, D Danny T. Levin. Uh, he's he's great. You know, I uh, I knew I uh, I wanted to um, to feature some brass, and I had kind of mocked it up here at home. I don't play uh, any brass instruments, but I could kind of sing them to myself, and I could play them on the keyboard. Right. You know, so I had a little bit of a roadmap, and I reached out to a friend of mine, Eric Gorfain, who I. Uh, I have done some some work with over the years. He's a great violinist and arranger. We we actually played in Auckland together oh. some years some years ago, um, and he said, "You know what? You ought to give this guy a call because he plays euphonium and all of these other cool instruments, and he could be your guy." And um, he was the guy for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, he's played with Regina Spector and uh, you know Iggy and all right. kinds of folks. You know. Uh, right. <laughs> I wasn't necessarily thing. looking for Iggy, Iggy like horns, uh, right. <laughs> um, but I liked the idea of, of a horn that was expressive and almost like a human voice. You know, I think, I think maybe that's my, my inroad to most, most of this stuff, you know, thinking right. about it as a, as a voice. Yeah. Now you have a song on the album called sometimes you wake up in Charleston. And of course these yeah. days, when you mention a name of a city, unfortunately it, stirs all sorts of thoughts and things are happening on a day-to-day -day basis all over the country. So right. the, possibly the, the, uh, the vibe of the song also changes from when you originally wrote it. Is that what's happened there or? Uh, well, I, 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 yeah, I think I follow your, your, your logic there. Uh, <laughs> if there is, know, there's, there's obviously, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we, uh, Charleston is, you know, aside from being a, 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 a beautiful place and a, a storied place, it's, right. uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, uh, how would you say, you know, a cradle of slavery here in, in the, uh, in the country, yeah. you know, so it has that, it has that uh, tragic past, you know, and uh, that shadow, that historical shadow. And uh, I found myself in Charleston a few years back, uh, they're playing a show. I woke up the next morning and thought I'd have a stroll about the town. And I realized that I was staying at a hotel just a, a few feet away from um, uh, Mother Emanuel Church there. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Where uh, a horrible shooting, mass shooting had occurred um, just maybe, you know, less than a year prior, you know. And uh, that prompted me to, um, to um, juggle all of these thoughts, you know. Um, and it seemed as though, you know, well, that's, this is certainly true of Charleston, but it's something that we, that same kind of shadow looms over our entire country. And, um, you know, it's something that we, uh, continue 
to try to come to terms with, you know, um, and it's been an explosive kind of year, Touch you know, back. an explosive decade, uh, you know, for sure yeah. in that regard. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I wrote the song maybe, uh, I'd say two years ago or more, um, lived with it and, um, just let it sort of, you know, brew in the crock pot for a while. Um, it's a fascinating thing though, when you put music out in the world, by the time, <laughs> by the time you put it on the calendar and it comes out, it quite often does take on a new meeting based on the context, you know, yep. the moment that it comes out, you know, um, a similar thing occurred with uh, Lowest Low, uh, a song on the album. That song's I wrote when I went to Italy on tour and um, I came down with some sort of flu bug <laughs> and uh, so I it sort of wrote it from that perspective of feeling like uh, I'm all cooped up and um, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to rise to the occasion and um, just sort of going to put a towel over my head and sit here in the dark. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, then, and then that became like the first sort of like a sampling of the song as we all, you know, shut ourselves into our homes, you know. What a strange thing to find um, that song, um, you know, as the ambassador for the album in the midst of a pandemic. Right, right. And that song, I mean, I have to say, you probably sound the most fragile and vulnerable on that track. So is that easy for you to do? Or do you have to like dig into yourself to be able to come out with that? Well, that's pretty much how I felt when I, when I, when I wrote it. And I think, um, I think, you know, that's, that's, that has been my goal with every album to try to remove whatever uh whatever doubt you know i think you know whenever when, whenever artifice kind of creeps into the process it usually is uh a, a shield uh for whatever self-doubt might be uh lurking so i've tried to remove that more and more you know um take away those things that that uh, that feel as though they create a moat between myself and the listener um you know, sometimes production can be that kind of obstacle, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, reverb steeped in reverb. I mean, it's a beautiful sound sometimes and sometimes. it's great for, you know, <laughs> if you're a Gregorian, <laughs> uh, but, but not so great, you know, when you want to just kind of like, you know, when you're trying to get across a certain, you know, uh, message, I guess. And yeah, yeah. So my records have become more sparse and more direct in that way. Right, right. And, and speaking of your records, I mean, this is your 10th solo album and you had a bunch more with various bands and whatever before that. So you've been doing this yeah. a while. You've been very uh, productive. And what, what keeps you going? What keeps you being creative? Oh, well, you know what? Um, I think there's always a list of, uh, of things that I'm trying to um, accomplish with each, with each album, you know? Um, I mean, on one hand, I have come to the point where I can accept what I have done prior, you know, um, <laughs> I can accept that I can't go back and tinker with those records and remix them. And I wouldn't want to, or remap that, you know, what's done is done. Right. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm quite proud of all the, the Grantley Buffalo albums and, um, and the ones that I've had the pleasure of making as a solo artist. Um, but that said, I'm still learning. I'm still accumulating ideas about how to, how to dial it in a little more, you know, yep. it may not. And, you know, it could be that the things that I'm concentrating on may be things that, uh, you know, that uh, a fan might not necessarily um, have any inclination about, you know, it could be that I'm, I'm fine. I'm finally <laughs> coming around to figuring out how to extract the very thing that somebody, you know, like, wow, I noticed there's less and less banjo on this record. It's like, right. yeah, that's, that was the problem all these years. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the banjo, man. <laughs> or, or maybe I'm, I'm figuring out there should be more banjo, you know, and like, why are his, why is he making banjo records now? It's like, but I don't know. So yeah. I'm always on my own sort of trip, I guess. <laughs> right, right. So I assume that you probably have had some time on your own because of all of the stuff going on. Are you thinking about what you're doing next? Are you writing songs? What's, what's what do you got planned? No, I'm not. I'm not necessarily. I'm not necessarily writing uh, with any real intention. Um, I mean, I'm all, on one hand, I'm kind of always in that mode. If right. uh, when I sit down with the guitar, if something comes to me that 
seems worthy of exploring that I will sing it into my iPhone and I'll, I'll revisit it and I'll see if there's something there, you know? Um, otherwise with the record having just came out, you know, a week or two ago, uh, I'm just sort of really trying to savor this moment. I'm trying to remember all the lyrics to this album so that I can perform them. You know, usually what happens by this time is that I'm out on the road. Sure. And, and I will get the chance to play the songs over and over and they'll become part of my muscle memory. And in that process of traveling, I'll be sitting on the bed bored out of my head. And that's when I begin to write new songs. Gotcha. So without that sort of travel induced boredom, it's hard to say, <laughs> you know, how prolific <laughs> right, one right. can remain, you know? So I'm at home. I'm, I'm, I'm tutoring my, my 12 year old daughter. I'm, I'm back in the seventh grade learning all about arithmetic, which is kind of nice for the first time. <laughs> yep, yep. And I'm playing a little bit of guitar and I'm painting pictures on the weekend and just, you know, trying to, trying to, uh, uh, you know, wash my hands and wear a mask and all that. Gotcha. Gotcha. The, the title of the you, album lightning show is your stuff. Did that come from your daughter? It did. Yes, you're right. Yeah. She was, uh, she was five years old and, uh, out in the backyard she raised the stick up to the sky and I heard her say, come on, lightning, show us your stuff. And then there was a mighty flash and a roar of thunder. And, um, and I thought, good God, you know, she has some sort of supernatural powers. <laughs> um, and uh, that's a true story. Uh, this was as we were preparing to come to Nashville and uh, I just kind of filed it away. And for some reason it, it, it kind of fell out of my head like uh, a bundle of earwax does every now and then. Yep. And uh, there was the title to the record. It made so much sense. Every album is a, an invocation. Right. So well, it's much speak, more appealing know. than a bundle of earwax. Uh, so. I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although that is a, a strange, uh, you know, but satisfying experience when that happens. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. <That's true. laughs> Usually happens when I'm wearing headphones too much. Uh, yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. It's, it, I, <laughs> I love you. hearing the record and love talking to you. Hopefully you'll be back on the road and you'll get that muscle memory thing going and yes. songwriting will kick in again. I'll find <laughs> my way to, uh, again. <laughs> I would love to, I would love to. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I look forward to to enjoying your eggs. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Bye-bye. See you later. Have a great one. Thanks, Marty.